and Francesca Eich, Associate in the Environmental Safety and Incident Response Group at Baker Botts, with our latest installment on important regulatory and legislative events in the first 100 days of the Biden administration. This week, EPA announced that it will dismiss more than 40 outside experts appointed by President Trump to EPA's Science Advisory Board and Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee. EPA Administrator Michael Regan emphasized that this move is aimed at improving the agency's scientific integrity. Also this week, the White House announced the members of the White House Environmental Justice Advisory Council. Environmental justice is a top priority for the Biden administration going forward. The 26-member council includes several prominent activists, including Dr. Robert Bullard, often described as the father of environmental justice, Peggy Shepard, founder of We Act for Environmental Justice, and Catherine Coleman Flowers, founder of the Center for Rural Enterprise and Environmental Justice. In other environmental justice news, this week EPA also withdrew a Clean Air Act permit for a major refinery in the U.S. Virgin Islands over environmental justice concerns. EPA will reconsider the permit in light of new information and President Biden's executive orders. Now I turn it to my colleague for further development. I'm Tom Holmberg, a partner in the Global Projects Group in the Washington, D.C. office of Baker Botts. On March 31, President Biden unveiled his American Jobs Plan. The plan is intended to transform U.S. infrastructure by, according to the president, investing in America in a way we have not invested since we built the interstate highways and won the space race. The plan is expected to cost $2 trillion over eight years. Its ambitious scope includes funding for obvious infrastructure projects such as highways and bridges. It also includes plans to, among other things, improve and modernize infrastructure such as drinking water, power grids, and broadband, produce, preserve, and retrofit schools, commercial buildings, and homes, expand access to home and community-based care for the elderly and disabled, and invest in research and development for manufacturing. Although this expansive plan would affect many sectors of the U.S. economy, a large focus of the plan is the development and advancement of clean energy, the electrification of the economy, and the reduction of greenhouse gases through, among other things, the deployment of carbon capture, use, and storage. The American Jobs Plan will require congressional action and will, no doubt, involve some degree of bipartisan negotiation and compromise. Given its broad scope, whatever plan is passed is likely to have profound effect on the regulatory landscape of the United States. Hi, I'm Emily Hudson, an associate in the antitrust group at Baker Botts, looking at updates in the antitrust sector. On March 29th, the FTC announced that they were abandoning their lawsuit against Qualcomm. The decision not to seek Supreme Court review ends a four-year litigation which began in the closing days of the Obama administration. FTC Acting Chairwoman Rebecca Slaughter, who was not serving on the commission when the lawsuit was filed, said the FTC would be facing significant headwinds if it tried to overturn the decision at the Supreme Court. Chairwoman Slaughter said, Now more than ever, the FTC and other law enforcement agencies need to boldly enforce the antitrust laws to guard against abusive behavior by dominant firms, including in high-technology markets and those that involve intellectual property. At the time the Qualcomm lawsuit was filed, it represented a rare example of U.S. antitrust officials taking action to prevent a major company from protecting its dominant market position through allegedly anti-competitive conduct. Since then, such cases have been on the rise. The FTC has sued Facebook, and the DOJ Antitrust Division has filed a complaint against Google. The influx of these new cases against large tech companies, the recent nomination of Lena Kahn to the commission, and Senator Klobuchar's proposal of the Competition and Antitrust Law Enforcement Reform Act, all indicate that U.S. antitrust enforcement will continue to be robust under the new Biden administration. This is George Fibby. I'm a partner in the Baker Botts Energy Litigation and Energy Regulatory Groups. This is an update on one of the Biden administration's earliest actions involving oil and gas leases on federal lands. You'll recall that while the president's executive orders targeted new oil and gas leases on federal lands, they did not prohibit permitting associated with existing leases. However, the Interior Department changed its internal process for 60 days to require that all such permits be approved by one of nine high-level political appointees at its D.C. headquarters. This was widely reported as a moratorium on permitting. Indeed, the number of permits to drill granted during the first 60 days of the Biden administration was dramatically lower than those in the last 60 days of the previous administration. That order, 3395, was set to expire March 21st, 
but the administration modified and extended it on March 19th. The new Department of Interior memorandum lists specific actions that require approval from the Assistant Secretary for Land and Minerals Management, including reinstatements of terminated oil and gas leases, extensions of permits to drill, and lease suspensions. The new memo does not state that it is temporary and has no set expiration. Although extensions of APDs are included, APDs, that's applications for permits to drill, themselves aren't listed. So it is not entirely clear to what extent this revised memorandum will result in a continued bureaucratic slowdown of the approvals of drilling permits. Many in the industry will be monitoring the number of permits granted to see if the pace picks up. Thank you.